Welcome to Borderland, an interview series with uh, experts in immigration ethics. I'm Jonathan Kwan, the postdoctoral fellow at the Markless Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Jose Mendoza, who is an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Washington and the co-editor of Radical Philosophy Review. Jose's research deals with topics concerning immigration ethics, Latinx identity, and racial justice. He is the author of The Moral and Political Philosophy of Immigration, Liberty, Security, and Equality, published by Lexington Books in 2017. He has written numerous academic articles that have appeared in journals such as the Journal of Speculative Philosophy, Public Affairs Quarterly, Critical Philosophy of Race, and Philosophy in the Contemporary World. Thank you for being with here, uh, being with us here today, Jose. Thank you for having me. Excited. Uh, so why don't we start off talking about uh, questions about enforcement in immigration ethics, which I know that you've written about recently. Um, in public and academic debates uh, on immigration, the question of who should be permitted to enter into a country is often kept separate from and seen as prior to um, how a country's immigration policy should be enforced. The implicit assumption is usually that once we've decided how we set our immigration policy, then that is the policy that should be enforced. But in your work, you've challenged this assumption and you've argued that matters of enforcement actually have implications for questions about who should be admitted and excluded from a country and so should be taken into consideration from the very beginning. Can you explain this position further and the arguments behind it? Uh, what's problematic about thinking about enforcement um, only as a secondary concern? So, um... What I tried to argue in, in, in my book is that I, I think there's actually kind of two ways of, of philosophically approaching the issue of immigration. And I, I think actually sometimes philosophers might, might get a little confused as to, as to how, how they're doing this or what they're trying to do. So one way of looking at immigration is to think of it as a problem for a particular kind of moral and political philosophy. So the issue of immigration in, in this way is, is not like other applied issues. So often you get an applied issue in philosophy, there's, there's you know, anthologies on applied issues. You take your favorite philosophical doctrine, Kantianism, utilitarianism, virtue ethics, and you run the death penalty or whatever issue you want through that framework. And, and it spits out an answer for you. But immigration is interesting and philosophers have found it interesting because actually it challenges a, a lot of the sort of deep uh, normative assumptions that we have, it, uh, it, it kind of, if, if you want to look at it from a kind of Rawlsian, uh, to use Rawlsian language, a kind of reflective equilibrium problem. You have principles and they conflict with other principles. Um, you have principles and they conflict with really deep held intuitions that you have. So what philosophers have done is they've looked at this issue and said, oh, well, look, we think that as, as good, you know, liberal philosophers that come out of the liberal tradition, um, communities ought to have a right to be democratically self-determined. And that's a particular kind of, you know, freedom, autonomy, and so forth, and, and that for the community. And that comes into conflict with freedom for the individual who wants to have freedom of movement. Or, you know, you look at it from an egalitarian standpoint, and you say, well, we, we like this idea of, of uh, you know, distributive justice at, at, at the domestic level. That's a form of equality. And there are ways that, that, that immigration seems to challenge that. So then, so then our domestic forms of equality come into conflict with more universal, you know, every, all in all persons have a, a, a um, um, should be giving equal, equal moral consideration. And so in this way, when you look at it this way, you're not actually dealing with immigration the way that most people worry about the problem. When you go out on the street and you talk to people about immigration, that, that's rarely what they're worried about. So there's mm -hmm. a way that you've taken a real life issue and made that real life and shown this real life issue exposes a problem for philosophy. So it, it becomes kind of like a trolley problem, right? We don't solve trolley problems to make better trolley conductors. We don't take uh, Peter Singer's shallow pond example to make better lifeguards. We take these examples as a way of showing us that our principles and intuitions are kind of out of whack. So, so what, what's happened though sometimes is, is philosophers think that we can take those things and then apply them to the real world. And what I think enforcement does is it raises 
the eth- it exposes the ethical issues that are motivating most people. Most people we do we do want the techniques of philosophy to help us with our immigration issue, but we we've got to take those techniques and apply them to the issues that that worry people. And there are some people who think that well, you know, we we can enforce our way out of this problem. But we have an immigration problem to the extent that we are unwilling to enforce it. Um, so spoiler alert: I- I'm on the opposite side of of, of, of these things. Um, my my argument is similar to an argument for, say, decriminalizing drugs, where it's not so much, you know, whether you think, you know, pro-drugs or anti-drugs, it's more the, the way we've enforced this thing has created way more injustices than, than the things that we think are, 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 um, are, are uh, that the enforcement's supposed to uh, take care of or, or deal with. So, so for folks like me, I think that what, what I want to look at are the times where you employ really harsh enforcement policies. And when you look at these these times, I think that perhaps the real problem is that we have an unjust, we're trying to enforce an unjust immigration policy. So you, you, you sit there and you say, well, why are we funneling people through the desert, having them die there? Why are people dying in the Mediterranean? All, all these things, holding people in, in camps and so forth. Um, that probably tells me that we have an unjust immigration policy. If you buy the assumptions that I have, which is that Immigration status is not a natural kind. It's a socially constructed category. Um, people can, there are ways that people are undocumented that are pretty obvious, other ways that they're not. Um, Melania Trump, uh, Donald Trump's wife, was actually technically an undocumented immigrant at one point. She came to the US on a tourist visa and did some modeling work. You can't work with a tourist visa. Like you automatically become undocumented. So it's, it's, a, it's a social construct. It's very complicated. Yet we treat it as natural. But once we see that it's kind of a construct, then we kind of ask ourselves, what kind of policy should we have? And I, I think once you have to enforce a very harsh kind of, you have to endorse a very harsh enforcement policy, then, you, um, th- th- then you're running into some real problems. And, and so really quickly, I, what was my solution? I looked at two kinds of enforcement, enforcement at the border. And I said, look, if, if you have to have these draconian poly- militarized kinds of borders, um, that suggests to me that you're not taking into account push and pull factors, which more than enforcement determine um, the, the migration of, uh, of folks. The enforcement really has pretty quickly diminishing returns. So it's true if you have very harsh enforcement, you, you, you'll deter and, and prevent you from entering. But, but that effect uh, has diminishing returns really quickly. At a certain point, push and pull factors over determine that. And in some mm-hmm. ways, we're responsible for creating both the push and the pull factors. Right. And then... Um, and then my last point, I'll, I'll let you jump in. Joseph Karens at one point um, had said that, uh, you know, guards have guns. And, 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 and that's, you know, that's the thing I emphasize. They, they have guns. But Chandra Kukath has pointed out the guns are sometimes pointed inward, not just outward. And so I've also looked at internal enforcement and, and what enforcement does to the, the folks who even the domestic justice or uh, domestic egalitarians think we, we, we owe, you know, uh, uh, we should treat as equal citizens, and that's yeah, sorry, and, and that is citizens. The way that internal enforcement uh, marginalizes uh, certain kinds of citizens. But I've gone a step further in my book and said it's not just that it's that it's, it's sort of bad um, libertarian, you know, government overreach. It's that those guns are not just pointed internally, but they're pointed at a very specific set of folks. And and in this way, uh, this very long-winded way, I've tried to give an indirect argument for open borders. So I've tried to have both. I've, I've tried to mm-hmm. look at enforcement thinking it gives us some real world answers, but also gives us kind of an underappreciated argument for academic philosophers for open borders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's all fascinating, fascinating argumentation. I mean, I really like the analogy to uh, decriminalizing drugs. Um, the idea that, well, look, if you have a policy and the only way to enforce that policy is to commit a bunch of injustices, then that shouldn't be the policy that you should have, right? Um, and so similarly, it's not as though you decide your immigration policy sort of in a vacuum beforehand and then decide, okay, whatever that immigration policy should be, then we figure out how to enforce it most efficiently or most effectively. But rather if the enforcement itself makes that policy, commits a lot of injustices, then that shouldn't be the policy that you should have. Um, I really like that way of 
flipping the the lens of how you should think about immigration. I mean, I think it's not just in academia that this um, assumption has been made, but certainly in public debates, I hear that a lot too. People say, well, look, we just want legal immigration. We have to decide what that is. And then once we decide what that is, we must enforce it as, as strongly as we can. Um, but your suggestion is, well, maybe if, if that is the way to go, actually, you're not able to do that justly. And so you ought to revise your policy to begin with to be more of an open borders kind of policy. I, you, you put it a lot more succinctly, pretty exactly. That, that, that is correct. Um, and, and it's true. I mean, migration is something humans have done since like, not just humans, all animals on this planet migrate for different reasons. And um, yeah, I, I, I think that exactly. I mean, it's, it, it's something folks do. And one of the things to also think about is to what extent is immigration itself the problem? Uh, a mm-hmm. lot of immigrants aren't desirous to, to leave their family and friends and so forth. Um, they're displaced. And, and if given a chance, they would rather stay home. Um, so there's, there's a way that we create, we displace people and then we enforce these borders and, and, and just make you know, some of the most vulnerable people on the planet even more vulnerable. Um, and exploit them, you know, e- e- even more. Mm-hmm. So, but but this is the one thing I do stress because because I think then the problem is keeping these two arguments distinct. And the other one that that I've kind of dropped out, but but I raised earlier, was a very interesting philosophical problem between you know the the debate between a community's right to self determination and individuals' freedom of movement, and, and all that is is sort of true. And then this, but this the way I do it, I think becomes much more of a truly applied philosophy, um, looking at the ethics uh, of, of the debates people are actually having, right? Um, mm-hmm. folks, folks in the Trump administration say, build that wall, we need more enforcement. The way we end the problem is through enforcement. And folks like me saying, no, enforcement really is the ethical problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good way of framing it for sure. Um, speaking about internal and external enforcement, um, I sort of want to talk about the issue of immigration. Uh, which I know you've written about as well, um, which usually refers to how immigration enforcement has been conflated with criminal enforcement as well. Um, And you sort of think this is a bit of a problem, but could you explain it um, for people who maybe haven't heard of immigration before, what it is and what's so problematic about it? Because I can see someone coming to this question and they they might think, well, this is just a matter of efficiency, you know, if... Uh, the government can enforce its laws by overlapping immigration law enforcement with criminal law enforcement. Why shouldn't it do that? And so this, this is, a, I, I think, one of the more troubling aspects that, that, that's kind of developed. So, so one of the things, and we'll, you know, something I'll keep coming back to is when and where does, does the movement of people become a problem? So for a long time, for most of human history, um, immigration wasn't so much the problem as emigration with an E. So a lot of, a lot of you know, kingdoms and fiefdoms and so forth, they wanted to keep people in. Uh, so, so getting the right to exit was a very important thing. Um, for, for, you know, for a big chunk of, of, uh, of the history of the United States, there, was no, there were no immigration exclusions. Those come around in the late 1800s for very racist reasons. Um, the United States had open borders with every country, let me stress this, every country in the Western Hemisphere up until 1965. We had basically, you, you got to show up to a, a port of entry and identify yourself and so forth, but we had open, open borders with every country in the Western Hemisphere. So, so when, when, do, when do these sorts of things uh, become a problem? Now, one of the things that, that as we have decided that we are gonna restrict folks, slowly but surely, one of the things we started doing was we started saying, one of the first things we started doing was saying, hey, if you have a criminal conviction, that's a reason to deport folks. So that's one. So there's three aspects to immigration. The first one is when criminal convictions carry immigration consequences. Now, this seems like a no brainer. Hey, you're asking me to come to your country. At least I can do is, is, you know, respect your laws. But one of the things that happens, especially for, for long term immigrants, immigrants who've been here more than five years, have established a home here and so forth. People do, you know, occasionally uh, either break the law or get accused of, of, of breaking the law. Now, 
one of the things that we have to keep in mind is when we bring these two things together are things like the fact that over 90% of, of cases now um, are, are done by plea bargain. So if I get you know accused of a crime, there's a very good chance I'm just going to try to plea out of it or give me less of a sentence and so forth. So I will plead guilty and, and take this, this lesser sentence. The, the court system is not designed for you to fight it. Like you will probably lose. It's designed for you to plea out now. This is a problem for immigrants if there are immigration consequences now. So, so the two things are separate. It's like, well, how much time are you going to spend in jail? Okay. Well, it turns out you might not spend any time in jail. Uh, you might just get a slap on the wrist, but you have pled guilty to this. And if you plead guilty to this, then you get deported. So you're given this kind of harsh you know, uh, buying, you're, you're in a hard buy, a tough buying if you're an immigrant, if criminal convictions carry with them immigration consequences, because now you're like, wow, in a system that's designed for me to plea out, to, to not fight this, you know, fight for my, my innocence, I, I, I can like get deported or I can try to fight this thing and get double whammy, get more um, uh, um, prison time and get deported. So so it, it creates, one of the things I've argued, it creates this kind of parallel justice system for folks, which I think is, is unjust. On top of that, I think, I, I think, and I don't have, I, you know, I might not win this argument with, with certain folks and I've tried. I think it's double punishment, right? There is like, well, why do you punish people for doing one thing done, but then you're adding a second punishment that, that again, is, is only there for, for immigrants. Um, I think it's inherently cruel to, um, to expel people, especially if they've kind of made a life for themselves. Now, this might apply more for long-term residents, but still, I think I, I find that if, if there is such a thing as cruel and unusual punishment, it's it's expelling people uh, in this way. Lastly, and, and, and I think this is important um, in a real-world context, when you deport people convicted of, of, of criminal offenses, you are putting a heavy burden on, on certain states that might not be able to take in these folks and, and reform them. So, so this might not be the case, say, with DUIs, but if you have people who have committed very serious crimes, our criminal justice system does not reform people. So it, and in fact, you, you can look at some of these studies and it tends to make the, the way, what we do to, to, to people in prisons actually can make them worse persons. And you take mm -hmm. these persons and then, and then you deport them to countries like El Salvador, and then you're shocked to find out that they were alienated in El Salvador, couldn't get jobs in El Salvador, there was there was nothing there to help them, and 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 they end up you know starting a gang called Salva Madre Tuche. So so one of the things we've mm -hmm. exported to El Salvador right. is 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 is, uh, is gangs and they become international. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is is when immigration violations the other way immigration violations come to have criminal style um, punishments, and and this is uh, I'll, I'll try to be short on this because I'm kind of rambling on, but this this one is very disturbing because immigration law is not criminal law. It's, it's part of the uh, executive branch. So the executive branch in this particular arena gets to be judge, jury, and executioner. It's their discretion. They get to decide the immigration law. Now, when you start attaching uh, prison time to some of these things, so let's say you, you're, you're guilty of re-entry. You've entered undocumented, right? They've sent you back. You re-enter. That, that starts to carry uh, prison time up to 20 years, they, they rarely give you 20 years, but you can get to 20 years in prison for, uh, for unlawful re-entry. Now, you, the problem here is when you get convicted of, of, of re-entry, you're, you're not entitled to a, a lawyer. Uh, a lot of the uh, constitutional uh, protections don't apply to you because this is not technically a criminal case. This is technically an immigration case and it's deci decided by the executive. So it's not, it's, not it's not the judiciary judges who decide this. These are folks who are appointed by the executive branch to judge over you. You're prosecuted by people that, that, that are appointed by the, the uh, executive branch. There is no separation of powers. The executive is judged during an executioner when it comes to immigration convictions. And if those things get criminal convictions added on top of them, right, you can start seeing the problem here. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's kind of a, you, you, uh, this weird loophole that you, that you can use on immigrants. Um, and then finally, and this is the one that I think is the most, um, the one you see the most is this conflate, the, when you take law enforcement agencies and you take immigration enforcement agencies and you allow each of them to use tactics or, or to perform the job of the other. So here we start seeing things like, um, what you see at the border recently, uh, you, you see 
immigrants who get detained who, are, who have asylum claims. They get basically put in jail. You are in jail. But it's not considered incarceration because technically you can leave anytime you want. You can just say, hey, I want to drop my asylum claim. I, I am willing to self-report. Right? And now you put people in a terrible bind. It's basically you either are in jail w- without the possibility of, of, of parole or sorry, for, uh, without the possibility of bail. Or you can go back to this country where you have a, 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 a you, you feel that your life is threatened. So, so you, you put people in prison, with, with, put them, you incarcerate people without <clears throat> giving them the, the protections we normally are afforded. Uh, when in any other context, we are incarcerated. Uh, you ask local police to perform immigration functions, which police officers themselves say this has created, um, you know, distrust within the community. If, if, if <clears throat> we're trying to police <clears throat> a community we want trust in the community. If the community is largely um, heavily uh, immigrant community, um, then, then we're not gonna get very much trust from, from that community. And, and finally, there is this, um, this mandate now, which is again, it's very recent, of asking immigration agents to do things that wasn't part of their mandate before, which is performing kind of like anti-terrorism and, and drug enforcement uh, duties. And what this has actually done you know, it's really kind of started in the in the 80s, but got ramped up back after September 11th, is the relationship between immigration agents and immigrants. Immigrants are not seen as, as people who could potentially become Americans or seeking to become Americans and so forth. They are seen and treated as as, as folks who, who should be suspicious. Um, and so so this changes the relationship between those two. So anyway, those those are three things that together come to form. When you, when you see them as a system, they, they, they are the heart of immigration and they are very troubling. And, and if we use something like, um, <clears throat> like the birdcage analogy for oppression, I think that's helpful because each one by themselves seems like, oh, okay, well, that's, you know, Mendoza, that stinks, but that's not that bad. That stinks, but that's not that bad. But if you kind of come to see this using the, uh, the famous uh, Maryland Fry birdcage example, you come to see the, the, the immigration is actually extremely pernicious and, and, and it all works together and, and to create this kind of larger injustice that goes unnoticed because each one of those things that I've kind of outlined for you, you might have kind of not a and been like, okay, that's bad, but not that bad. But 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 together they, they form this this larger injustice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems, it seems to me that the issue of immigration really reveals how if you're going to do political philosophy on immigration, you have to pay attention to the specific details of how exactly enforcement happens. Because there, are, as you outlined, there are all these complicated ways in which the conflation of criminal law enforcement, immigration law enforcement causes all these injustices, these double binds, these oppressive policies, you know, lack of due process, uh, lack of checks between different agencies, et cetera. But if you sort of just think in a vacuum, well, we have our policy, our immigration policy, we ought to enforce it. Why not leverage all the agencies that we can to try to enforce that policy? You'll kind of uh, ignore all the actual injustices on the ground that are happening as a result of what's known as immigration. Um, sort of related to immigration, um, I wanted to ask you a question about abolition. Um, of course, in the past year or so, there's been a lot of discussion about abolishing the police, abolishing prisons, especially in the wake of protests over police killings of Black Americans like George Floyd and others. Um, the abolition movement has gained more traction and become more visible in the mainstream public. Now, if you are sort of upset about immigration, you might be even more radical and take a step back and say, well, it, it's not just the conflation of criminal law enforcement and immigration law enforcement. It's this whole complex, this whole incarceration complex. Um, And so really we should fight for abolition and abolishing police, abolishing prisons. We have to think about that, not just for citizens, but also for non-citizens. And so we also need to link prison abolition with ICE abolition and with abolition of immigration detention. So I was thinking, I was wanted to ask, what do you think about these larger arguments about these abolitionist frameworks being applied to the immigration context? Um, do you find them helpful um, in your analysis? I, 
I think so. Um, so uh, as, as you could probably guess, um, I mean, I hope I didn't come off as crazy. I think a lot of things I think are, are very reasonable. And I'm like, whoa, these things are very upsetting. And then I come to conclusions that, that I think people think are extremely radical, but yeah, but but uh, very much so. I, I am pro um, of Atlas ICE. Um, and, and, and I do think that linking these things up with, uh, you know, abolishing the police make all the sense in the world to me. Um, I think we have to ask questions of like, you know, um, what's the goal of, of enforcement? What, you know, can we achieve the overall goals that, that enforcement is supposed to, to bring us uh, using non-lethal, non-militarized forms of, of enforcement? And, and most people smarter than me who, who look into this say, yeah, we could achieve these goals through these other avenues. We don't need cops. To, and, and even police themselves say, like, we don't, we don't, you know, we're not trained to do these other things that could get to the root of these problems. Uh, and if we got to the root of these problems, we, we could achieve our goals better instead of trying to enforce our way um, out of all these things. So then you've got to stop and ask yourself, well, well what's keeping these things going? Um, and, and one worry I have, and, and I think part of what's motivating your question is a lot of the answers I give tend to be, and, and I think it's the right approach for now, uh, more immigrant rights related. So what, what rights and protections can we give immigrants? What, what limits can we put on enforcement, right? And, 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 and I haven't, even in my book, I didn't go all the way and say abolish ICE. Um, and, and I think what motivates the question, correctly motivates your question is, oh, Mendoza, you kind of got us like right to the edge and you didn't sort of jump. And, and part of it is, I, I, I don't know how to go about yet uh, abolishing these things because I think there's powerful forces motivating them. And there's this kind of perverse, uh, which is, I, I put this phrase in a, in a new piece that, that, that's coming out, this kind of like perverse Keynesianism. Um, we have a lot of folks who want to have, you know, want to have middle-class jobs. Uh, we have a lot of folks, um, Lockheed and Martin, who want to sell their wares. And as we leave places like Afghanistan, um, as badly as we are right now, um, people still need to sell their weapons, need to sell their wares. And there's a way that the economy depends on, on these places selling their wares, making money. And the, the border security industry is very profitable and it's expanding. It blows people's mind to learn that, you know, in 1989, when the most infamous militarized border of all time, the Berlin Wall fell, there was something like 15 um, militarized borders all around the world. Today, there's something like 77, right? They, they, they employ a lot of people. They buy a lot of products. Going back to the, the guards have guns. Well, we should also add to Joseph Carrot's uh, notion of the, the borders have guns and Kukathas that they're pointed at us is that those guns are super expensive and they're super profitable. And the guys holding the guns and gals, they have the people holding the guns, um, they, they have employment that otherwise would make them under or, or unemployed. And so there is this kind of perverse economic system at play. And so there's, there's a sense where we can make all the, the, the rational and moral arguments we want, but, but unless we start looking at the economics that are driving these things, um, you know, there, there are a lot of powerful forces to keep these things in place. So I, I want to do two things. I, I want to critique the larger economic system that, makes this a rational thing to pursue, which is more and more enforcement uh, to be able to, 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 to do these things, but also at the same time realize that like that's not going to come tomorrow. And what I can do is, is hopefully provide some, some protections to the, 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 the most vulnerable. So um, the, the simple, the short answer to your question is yes, I, I think it's very helpful. Uh, but then I think it becomes a matter of can we can we chew gum and, and walk at the same time? Can can we sort of argue for limiting enforcement and, and immigrant rights without at the same time endorsing the system? And that's really tricky because mm -hmm. I, I kind of find myself in that bind sometimes that in order to defend immigrants and uh, provide protections for them, there, there's a sense where you're playing the game. And when you're playing the game, you kind of justify the system, if that makes sense. Right, maybe you're a little bit too reformist or supportive yeah. system when you should, should be abolishing um, the system as a whole. I mean, it does seem like there are those kinds of arguments in the abolitionist literature and in the abolitionist social movement that seem yeah. helpful in thinking about immigration. There's these debates about reform versus more radical abolition. 
um, the analysis of racial capitalism, how that informs the prison industrial complex. And uh, I feel like not a lot of people in academia have written about that in terms of, at least philosophers, in terms of what you're saying, in terms of border enforcement, how the logic of racial capitalism, this industrial complex applies to uh, the immigration complex as well uh, and how borders are being managed. Um, and maybe this segues me into my next question, which is about race. Um, not every political philosopher who's thinking about immigration, you know, foregrounds race in their work, but you certainly do. Um, and I want to ask you about this debate in academia between racism versus xenophobia. Um, should we think about discrimination in immigration policy as a kind of racism or as a kind of xenophobia? What's the difference between the two? Um, and, you know, what, what, what is your take on that debate? Um, so, so for me, um, so I'll give you the simple answer and then I'll go into one of my longer rants. The simple answer is I want to have as many effective tools in my toolbox to, to undermine oppression, exploitation, discrimination, all that stuff as possible. And, and I think I think it is helpful to distinguish between the two, um, even though between xenophobia and racism, e e even though it's also at the same time very important to see all the ways and how often they actually do overlap. So it's like it's so one thing that says, yes, here are the ways they overlap and work together. Um, but there are times, I think, where, where the two don't overlap. And, and, it, and, and if we don't have sort of tools to help us see this. It, it, it's going to make us think that we maybe have solved a problem. Um, with, and the, you see this in immigration all the time. You, you say, well, we're not racist anymore. Well, th there's a way that, that xenophobia can be just as bad. Or you could say, well, we're not xenophobic anymore. And you continue to racism. But, but overall, I mean, what are the differences be between the two? And, and, and xenophobia, you know, could be harms, wrongful discrimination, whether direct, indirect, uh, individual or systemic. And that, that's based on, on actual, more than likely perceived non-citizenship where racism is, is similar, but it's based on you know, actual or, or perceived race. And the xenophobia versus racism debate within the philosophy of race comes out of, a, of a, well, I don't know if it's a large debate, but, but it is larger than that, which is whether we should employ a wide scope or a narrow scope of racism and, and there are good arguments sort of on, on on both sides so when you say wide scope or narrow scope you say what one thing you say is well what harms um should all harms that are that are racial wrongs uh be considered racist and and, and folks like like larry blum have said well look there's there are certain harms that we we should reserve racism is such a morally powerful uh um condemnation and we think it should be that powerful that we should just reserve it for the really harsh kind of racial wrongs and, and let some other racial wrongs just be that, just call them racial wrongs. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe certain jokes or something that, that are, you know, so, so he thinks of it as a level, like racism is hitting a racial wrong at a very high level. Uh, and, and if you don't meet that threshold, doesn't mean that it's okay. These things are still bad. Just, you know, reserve racism for these really bad ones. But there's another way of, of, of having a, a broader or narrower scope of racism. And that's with regard to which, which kind of group-based harms should we call racist. So when you look at, say, for example, the, I, I've been, I'm a baseball fan, the, the, the logo of the Cleveland baseball team. The logo of the Cleveland baseball team is clearly racist in my opinion. But what about the, the, the character for the Boston Celtics, Lucky, the leprechaun who runs around and is goofy? Right. Uh, is there a way that someone could be offended by that? Would that be racist? And so you start to see there's 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 we, we can go this way by levels. Right. There's is, is a is a race is a racial wrong. So does it have to meet a certain threshold to be considered racist? And then we can go look, look at it this way. And we look at groups is discrimination against someone by based on religion racist. Uh, you know, it gets tricky in some cases. Yes. Some cases. No doesn't mean that it's better or worse, right? Uh, so which groups, which bad wrongs against certain groups count as racist? And one of the things I've, I've tried to argue is that I think American whiteness is deeply connected to citizenship and xenophobia and racism have, have intertwined um, 
But if you don't separate the two, I think you you start to you you look at what happens to the say the the Germans in the uh, early 1700s. And if you look at some of the things Ben Franklin said about the Germans, they're almost word for word what Donald Trump has has said about you know um, uh, Muslims in the United States, right? They they they're weird. They speak this. They've got this weird uh, religion and so forth. So they're Germany. The, and Franklin said that Germany was not sending us their best and their brightest before Trump said they're not sending us our best and brightest. Mm-hmm. Right? But there's a way these groups eventually get incorporated into American whiteness. The Irish, Italians, all these folks are able to, to, to come into the melting pot um, in, in a way that other groups, even when they're given citizenship, even when their citizenship is no longer in question, aren't ever you know, considered real Americans, but for different reasons, which are racial reasons. So... What, what I think is helpful is to have this kind of distinction in, 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 our, in our back pocket. Um, and it's not, that doesn't mean, I guess, that I guess what I'm trying to say is that doesn't mean that, that xenophobia and racism are always separate and that we need to keep them separate because often they come together, but that sometimes they, they do come apart and we need to see when it does. Because if when we don't, we, start, we might start making assumptions that are unwarranted. And so this is something else I've written on, which is that the Latinx community is not racially homogenous. And the fact that it's not racially homogenous means that we can't always expect the, the entirety of the Latin American community to act in, in the way or, or to feel racism in the way that you know indigenous communities, Asian communities, black communities face racism, because there's gonna be, so for some Latinos, namely white Latinx folks, um, white supremacy might be on offer to them in the way that mm-hmm. white supremacy was on offer for the Irish, the Italians, the Germans, these folks. And if we don't sort of see these differences and, and the way that xenophobia is kind of keeping the Latinx community as a, as a group together right now, the way that when xenophobia might wane for some folks, right, some of these other folks might end up Again, so there, there are definitely Black Latinx, Asian Latinx, Indigenous Latinx for whom, you know, this this will never be on offer. But if we don't understand how these things work, then we start treating groups as monolithic when they're in fact not monolithic. And then we're kind of surprised as to why did the, why why is the leader of the Proud Boys a Latinx person? Why was George Zimmerman Latinx? Right? Mm-hmm. Because there's a way that that xenophobia and racism do come together, but also come apart sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. I feel like oftentimes in public debates, um, xenophobic immigration policy is just labeled as racist, but there's not this further analysis that you're sort of bringing to the table about if we're really trying to unpack how that oppression works, we had to think about these two as separate, but also sometimes coming together. Um, and that really gives us a more complex picture of about how we might want to combat um, the problems and the wrongs that are there. Um, well, so now, sort of to shift gears a little bit, I want to ask you a bit about current events um, and what you think about, uh, in particular, the Democrats' um, $3.5 trillion budget reconciliation package that provides a path to citizenship for 10 million or so people. It was passed in the Senate because of budget reconciliation rules. Um, the Democrats only needed a simple majority to pass this in the Senate. Um, so they were able to avoid a, a Republican filibuster as long as the legislation uh, pertained to the federal budget to spending and revenue. Um, but something else that I noticed is that in the budget reconciliation packs, there's also um, a, a proposal for increased investment in border security. So sort of related to our discussion at the beginning of this interview, um, there's in a way, a compromise that's being made about how, well, we're going to provide citizenship for more people, but on the flip side, we're going to increase security, increase enforcement. That's often a refrain that you hear uh, mainstream Democrats sort of propose in order to sort of um, fight for the kinds of immigration reforms that they are in favor of. Um, But yeah, what do you think about um, the budget reconciliation package? So there's there's Mendoza, the the human and 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 i think that anything that's going to um regularize the status of folks who are very vulnerable right now is is a good thing um 
And I also feel that no, no matter what they do, they, they, it's not like they've stopped. We, we, we've, we've kept people who think we're not enforcing the border just are, are living in a different reality. The number, the money, uh, the, the kinds of weapons we use at the border have like dramatically uh, um, um, you know, grown in, in the last 25, 30 years uh, by like 2000% in certain areas. So we're heavily enforcing the border. So we haven't stopped that. So this, in some sense, this might be a slight increase to what we're doing, but it's not like we've stopped doing it. So that's the sort of uh, human Mendoza um, tacit support for this. But in the sense that, yeah, I, I get the enforcement stuff, but I, I want to protect the, uh, the most vulnerable. But I, I think this is a product of having three different positions on immigration three different philosophical positions on immigration and none of them taking what I take to be the radical approach, which is getting to the root of whatever we think the problem is, which is people being forcibly displaced and being made vulnerable. But the other three, the, the other three are, are sort of like the liberal egalitarian reformist view, which is not wrong, which says, hey, look, you know, people are vulnerable. We need, we need to help them. There is the uh, kind of neoliberal uh, capitalist uh, view which says look the market can solve all problems what we just need to do is is is, is open up immigration you know and and so usually you'll find skill based uh increase for skill based immigration in, in that and then there's the reactionary view and this is kind of to try to appease some folks in the reactionary view which is we can just enforce our way out of it um so so one is the the second one i mentioned the capitalist neoliberal one is interesting because it's kind of open borders but for free markets uh, the reactionary view is is um, the the more uh, draconian enforcement, and then the reformer is kind of stuck in the middle there, and and I think that's what we that's what the Democrats are are proposing. Um, I don't know what I would do if I was a politician. Um, I'm glad I'm an academic and I, I can say the kinds of things I can say, uh, but it's um, it's I, I I don't think I I think this will help some people. It's, it's not going to address the underlining issues that, that create the immigration problem. I, I've, I've said sometimes that immigration, the immigration problem can almost be an epiphenomenon phenomenon in the sense that we just have some, so much injustice in this world that if we were to somehow rectify these other things, really immigration wouldn't be a problem. If you go back to the thing I mentioned earlier, like when do people, the, the movement of people become a problem? Uh, I had no problem, I had zero problem going from Massachusetts to Washington State the, this past year. Came over, said, hey, here I am. Here's my driver's license. Can I have a new one? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd like to start voting in, I moved here in August. I was voting at the end of September. No problem. No one had a problem with me voting in these local elections, even though I've been here less than a month and a half, um, right? Because I, I, my move, the kind of person I am and my movement is okay, um, right? It's, it's these, it, it, it only becomes a problem. Um, when you, when you go and you look at when you when you have Jim Crow even and, and, and so on, when when it is you're restricting people from accessing certain things, it's because something else is usually going on. So so the immigration problem is it, it's it's a real philosophical problem. I think in for, I think it's you, you see it expressed in enforcement, but in some ways it can be an epi phenomenon in the sense that what's really underlining it are these other injustices, and if you were if we were somehow able to address these injustices. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that Europe had free movement within its borders. Why? Well, because France didn't think of its neighbors and the people in those countries as a problem. Um, we, we, we tend to think of certain people as a problem, and that's when, you know, these, these, these immigration, pro this thing pops up as an immigration problem. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, that's a fascinating reframing uh, of maybe not the immigration problem, just the host of immigration problems, plural, sort of that come with living in a non-ideal world, a world full of different sorts of injustices uh, that contribute to what we see as immigration problems. Um, okay, let me ask you, let me end on one final question. Um, at the Marcos Center, we often talk about using ethical lenses to help guide our decision-making. And we have a framework that employs uh, five, soon to be six, ethical lenses. So I wanted to ask you in the context of immigration ethics specifically, um, what do you think would be an ethical lens that would be helpful for helping us think about immigration problems? I, 
I, I, and I hope this is kind of clear from some of the things I've been saying. I, I think the way I approach it is kind of anti-colonial. Um, I, I think that certain states continue to mine the resources of, of, of other countries, uh, whether that, that be their natural resources or, or, the, or the labor power of, of, of their people. And in some ways of doing that requires that people who want to come to this country and work be vulnerable and, and, and more easily exploitable and be willing to do the shittiest work for the lowest wages um, to, to keep the standard of living that we have. In other cases, so, so when you take this anti-colonial framework, what I want to say is you start to see borders very different. You start to see that the exclusions are only targeting certain people. And even then, it doesn't, they're not really meant to keep them out in some sense. They're, they're meant to, 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 if you make it across, you'll be vulnerable. But you look at corporations, corporations, borders don't exist for them, uh, for the, the hyper wealthy. The, these folks, the hyper wealthy, the hyper elite, they do what, what undocumented immigrants are always accused of doing. They go to, you know, to, poor, to poor countries and they trash them. They, they wreck their environment. They exploit them and then they leave when like it's no longer beneficial to them. Right? They have like, no loyalty to that place. And so there's a way that when you start, when you take an anti-colonialist framework and you start seeing borders in that way, um, the borders just do different things. The border isn't just a fixed line anymore. Uh, the, the US uh, border with, with the global South no longer begins with Mexico. It, it, it begins you know, with, uh, with Honduras. Uh, we actually you know, uh, supply and, and, and fund the, the border enforcement of not just Mexico, not just El Salvador, not just Guatemala, but all the way down to Honduras. Um, there was a, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, he had a great quote, I should remember his name. He said, we, don't, we, can't have, we can't have this as a series of gold line stands. He said, where, where the US border should start is, you know, uh, 2000 miles south in Peru. Like he wants to go all the way down. And, and, and it's not just, you know, um, and it's not just you know uh, 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 land wise, right? We have border patrol in in um, in, in, in airports in, in other countries. We continue we we patrol the border with Haiti and the DR uh, because you know if you get to the DR, then you could probably get to Puerto Rico, right? So so there's a way that borders expand inwardly, as we talked about, outwardly, but they're not. They're not like barriers. I mean, these, these things are working a system. So, so they're, they're barriers to some, but they actually help other folks. They, they either don't apply or actually facilitate the movement for, for other folks. And, and it looks kind of chaotic. Like how, who gets to do what up until I think you, you take an anti-colonialist look at this and you say, oh, I see. Now, now I see how these different borders, uh, um, I think the term is, uh, someone's called it, I forget who, border sets, how they work together again as a system, mm -hmm. how they work, what they're trying to accomplish. And, and once, if we really, we really want a, a just world, we have to understand how these things work in order to, uh, to dismantle them. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, if you think about the border and you think about immigration problems as epiphenomenal in a way, maybe they're epiphenomenal over colonialism and histories of colonialism, ways in which the borders as a system helped to perpetuate um, colonialism in that way. Um, and I think linking back to our discussion on enforcement from the very beginning, if you think about enforcement of immigration policies as a secondary concern, maybe you miss the way in which enforcement ends up being enforcing colonial borders and colonial structures, colonial systems, reinforcing them in, in different ways. I, yeah, I think that's that's right, and um, this is kind of one of the things that, that uh, not, I don't want to call it a nugget of truth, but one of the things that motivates Joseph Karen's uh, analogy says that that, that uh, citizenship is like the new feudal privilege, and and I think we can say more than that. But the, but but what's right about that in, in, is that if you go back, you know, even like a hundred years ago, um, maybe a little more, but but even even then, get to come. There's a way that colonialism was, was just seen as normal. Like, this is just what you do, like kind of old school colonialism. Um, you just took it for granted. And, and, and then we saw it and we're like, oh, this is really bad. And people fought for, for, for liberation. Um, 
And now we found a way to reinstate it. And and the and citizenship and and um, you know in the current immigration system is presented to us as just natural. Like this is just the way things are, right? It's not colonialism, it's just the way things are. So it's it's interesting to me how people who defend sort of the, the, the current status quo in a way, um, do it in such a reflexive way, but but don't understand that it's really kind of covering over justifying these these other things. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Jose, for joining me today um, and speaking with us. Um, and this will be available on the Marcos Center website, as well as the Marcos Center's uh, YouTube page. So uh, feel free uh, to find it there. But thanks again, Jose. Thank you. Have a good one.